Welcome back to the Indianapolis Arrows franchise. The Arrows sit here at 17 and 14 here in season number five, 30 games into the season. And in the AL Central, we are 17 and 14. The Guardians are 18 and 14, and the Twins are 17 and 15. All three teams are pretty competitive. So this is going to be a competitive division this year, and this is why it was important to add a couple of bats to the lineup in order to compete, especially with the Guardians. They have an excellent lineup. We are sitting here at ninth in average in the MLB, and for the first time, we are both top 10 in average and ERA. ERA, we sit here at 10th in the MLB. The White Sox are up there at number 8. But this season has been highlighted by a couple of surprising players, including Ray Gonzalez, our number one draft pick in this entire series. He was picked number eight overall, and he was excellent when we selected him. 18 years old, 70 overall right away with 90 potential. You can just see the difference between his ratings back then and now. He has dramatically improved 14 points overall he's definitely went up with his vision that's been probably his biggest uh upgrade as far as attributes and he has been very very good we have added the beard on back on to ray gonzalez remember he was drafted with a beard when he was 18 i took that off because that's not really realistic He's been clean shaven ever since, but now in his 21-year-old season, he now has that beard back. A 1,000 OPS, 336 average. He's slugging 586, and he's on his way to having his career high in home runs. So I just want to take a closer look at the kid, Ray Gonzalez. He has definitely shown that he's ready for that superstardom now. It's taken a couple of seasons in the MLB. He was ready faster than most young prospects would be, but he is here. Ray Gonzalez hitting 336. He is 10th in the AL in OPS as well. So we'll see what happens. Seven home runs, and he does have a updated batting stance coming into this season. The hands are lower. It's more controlled and allows him to have more power as he hits one well to right field, but right to the right fielder. Every time he makes contact, it seems like now, he's hitting the ball hard, and that's maybe the difference. It's the maturity at the plate that I see from him. He's facing Cade Horton here in the top of the fifth inning, 0 for 1 today with that fly out to right field. Man on second and third, and he hits one hard to third base, and it's a hard ground ball, and he will get thrown out at first base. The one thing that Ray Gonzalez, I wish he had, was that speed. If he had that speed, he would have been would have been hit at the top of the lineup a lot sooner than probably projected. But here is the maturity at the plate I'm talking about. This is a long at bat here of fouling off pitches left and right. Ray Gonzalez has that excellent vision. It's at 88. I'm pretty sure that's going to get to 99 one day, probably in like two years. So here facing Jordan Holloway, the 14th pitch of the at-bat is low in the zone. He hits it hard up the middle, and that's what I talk about, the maturity at the plate to be able to foul off about seven foul balls right there in a row and beat out that ground ball up the middle. That speed will get better. It's probably going to peak at about 65 speed, 67, 67, 68, somewhere around there but he's going to be an excellent hitter in the future. He honestly reminds me, I'm not saying, you know, pound for pound, but Derek Jeter. I mean, Derek Jeter was a really good hitter. He was excellent defensively. Obviously, Jeter has better speed, but to me, I think that Ray is going to be that type of player that's going to be a captain for the team and be a leader going forward. So now we face the Wranglers next, and the Wranglers, through their rebuild, have not yet had a winning season, and it doesn't look like it's going to happen here. Their pitching staff is doing absolutely horrible. As you can see, Troy Melton threw six starts, a high ERA, a high whip. He's over a seven ERA as a starter. He's one and four. I mean, this is not going the right direction. But Ray Gonzalez comes into this matchup in a three-game set, hitting 344, hitting the ball excellently to start the season through the first 35 or so games here on a one-two pitch he gets one right over the middle and the one thing that he is going to just need to do to get to the next next level for ray gonzalez 
is when he gets a pitch like that, that's got to be over the wall. Troy Melton now facing Ray in his second AB now. He hits one hard up the middle, and look at the pop on the bat. I mean, this is just tremendous thing stuff we're seeing from Ray. Some of these are going to fall. You, you, you got to believe that, though. Pat Washington was hitting at the leadoff spot, taking over for uh, Ojo Taikan, who started there at the leadoff spot earlier in the season. But Pat Washington was there. But we're trying to help Ray Gonzalez here in that one spot today and seeing how he likes it there. But he is 0 for 3 so far uh, in his first three at-bats. But he does get us uh, not a sacrifice fly, but he does move the runner over to third base. And that brings up Brandon Lau, who hits one to right field. And the power comes through for both Ray Gonzalez and Brandon Lau, bringing in the run from third. And it's a 1-1 ball game. Top seven now. Hunter Gaddis into pitch facing Ray Gonzalez. The runner is on the move, and that's Pat again. And he hits one up the middle for his first hit of the day. And it will be a single. And now runners on first and third, runners on the corners. But unfortunately, in this inning, we did not get any runs across there with two outs. So we move on to the top of the ninth inning. One for four a day here for Ray Gonzalez. Now, he started the day hitting 344. Another hit will get that average back to 344 as he lost three points today. And he hits one hard up the middle. That one is a single to center. And it will score the runner from second. A two for five day from Ray Gonzalez hitting in that leadoff spot. And I kind of like him there. If he continues to hit the ball with, like, power like he is, though, I might have to move him to maybe two or three in the lineup. We get the three to one win today. Sean Manaya goes and gets his fifth win of the season. He starts out five and zero. Oh. I did not expect him to be this good right away. Like I thought he was just going to be a you know average pitcher who's going to be replaced by Taro Blake, who's coming up in the organization. But he's pitching really, really well. He's five and zero. Oh. So now we start the month of May. You can just see the opponents that we're facing. We uh, won two of three versus OKC, the Wranglers. We ended up winning two of three from Texas. We win this one nine to two, and Sean Manai gets his sixth win on the year, giving up eight hits, but only one earned run, walking one, two. He is off to an excellent start. Josh Brody got the save in that one as well. So we're doing pretty well to start the season. We're 24 and 18. We end up splitting with the St. Louis Cardinals in a two game set. We end up playing the tough Atlanta Braves on the road. And now Sean Manaya goes for his seventh win on the season. I want to see if he gets this. 6 0, 231 ERA facing Kyle Wright, who's got a higher ERA. We'll see what happens in this one. But right away in the first inning, Paulo Reyes comes through in the RBI single, making it 1 0 right off the bat. Now in the second inning, we score another run. Pat Washington with an RBI single. Our offense is really, really different this year. I mean, we don't have the speed that we would hope, and that's kind of why we're keeping Pat Washington in the lineup because he does provide that speed and defense. But we pretty much are generating runs by pretty much having higher averages, having guys that can hit for extra base hits. That's kind of how we're driving in these runs so far to start this year. So it's two to nothing going into the seventh inning. I mean, Sean Manaya is pitching a gem, and there is Ray Gonzalez with the two run home run. That's why I need him at the top of the lineup because if he can do that, that is just amazing. So I'm considering keeping him at the leadoff spot. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section. I might end up moving him to the two or three. Obviously, we would have to figure out where to move Verdugo in the lineup, to be honest, because I like Verdugo at the three spot. But looking at this game, it's definitely showing me some things. Having a two-run home run there in the seventh inning. Now we're into the ninth inning. Sean Manaya is still on the mound, and we're letting him keep riding it out. But right here, we have to go to the bullpen. I don't want to you know, ruin anything here. So we bring in Reynaldo Lopez here to get us one out. But he gives up two runs. He gives up another single. And now it's 5-3 to three with runners on first and second. We bring in Archie Bradley to get us out of this, and he does. Wow, facing Ronald Acuna at the plate. 
That would have been devastating to lose that one for Sean Mania. He gets his seventh win on the year. Look at the uh, stats he has. 2-4-4 ERA, a 112 whip, and 59 innings pitched. Incredible, incredible start to the season. So now we hop into the next series where we face the Cleveland Guardians. The Guardians are probably the team we're going to be seeing towards the end of the year and a team that we're going to have to compete against. But another guy in this series that's kind of been a mystery to solve has been Bay Miller. We acquired Bay Miller a while ago, back in season number two. We acquired him after he was drafted by the Rays. We traded, ended up trading them Eric Lauer in a trade, and we ended up getting Babe Miller back. And Babe Miller was good for us in season, the second season we had with him. 24 quality starts. He had a 1 2 4 whip. Last year, he just was terrible. A 4 7 1 ERA, a 1 3 8 whip. But this year, look at his numbers a 4 6 4 ERA, a 107 whip. He's got only five quality starts. 27 earned runs giving up 44 hits it's just one of the weirdest things i've seen through nine starts i mean he's pretty much giving up a home run a game but his whip is extremely low so he's either giving up like two three run even grand slams at a time and that's been hurting his era but his whip remains low at 107 so here we go let's check him out in action he does give up a leadoff single here in the first inning, but Yanni Diaz comes up to the plate. Fly ball to right field. That one is run down here by Babe, or by not by Babe Miller, by Alex Verdugo. So now Jose Ramirez at the plate, struggling at the plate so far this year. 235 average. He swings and misses at the four-seamer on the outside half of the plates. Josh Naylor at the plate, hitting 270. He grounds out to second base here and gets us through the first inning with no damage done. So we'll see what we can do versus Cal Quintrell. He is 3 and 4, 490 ERA, a little high. Whip is about average, 132. And here is the kid, Ray Gonzalez. We're going to continue to hit him during this episode at that leadoff spot. His average is down to 313, still hitting well, though. But this one, he pops up to center field for the first out of the game. That's gonna bring up Verdugo. Like I said, I wanna figure out what I wanna do with him in the lineup if we decide to move Ray Gonzalez to that two or three spot, because it is a possibility, because I do want speed up there. I still think Pat Washington is doing really well at the leadoff spot. But what do you do with Joey Manessas, who's hitting 316 on the season? He swings and misses, but he's having a tremendous start to the year. We'll have to highlight him in a closer look in a later episode. So Bay Miller continues now in the second inning, facing Tyler Freeman, who hits one deep to left field. It's a no-doubt home run. And the Cleveland Guardians are on the board. one nothing here to start this three-game set. Johnny Olsen to the plate. He was a draft pick of the Guardians back in season number one. He flies out to center field. Pat Washington is under that one. He's playing in center field over Dylan Carlson today, who usually is the center fielder, and it's 1-1. On to the top of the fourth inning. This is Josh Naylor who goes to opposite field. That one will get down the line, and it will be an RBI double as Jose Ramirez comes around to score and makes it 2-1. Two to one. So Josh Naylor was a guy I was actually looking at earlier in the series, but the Guardians were asking for too much at the time. I did not decide to trade for him. Lotus Guriel Jr. comes to the plate now, and he hits one to almost the same location, a little softer this time, but that's going to be a single, and it's a 3-1 ball game. So the Guardians taking a lead here in the third inning, or in the fourth inning, and here is Tyler Freeman going the opposite way down the right field line. That one drops. He's two for two in this game. And the Guardians are putting together a hitting clinic here in the fourth inning. Still no outs. That brings up Oscar Gonzalez to the plate, and he swings at one low, and that one will be the first out of the inning. As that brings up Johnny Olsen. Same result, the outside and low cutter for the swinging strike three. How about this? 89 pitches, and we're just finishing the fourth inning. Fly ball to center field. Washington under that one. And maybe that's the issue. Bay Miller just gives up hits in bunches. Other innings are fine, but then it's just like that. 
Joey Benestas here in the bottom of the fourth inning, still hitting the ball extremely well. He's he and Ray Gonzalez are the two hottest hitters on our team, no doubt. But Manessas, I had to move him up in the lineup. He's been hitting way too well. Paulo Ray is still in that four spot. He will hover around that three, four spot. He's just too good of a hitter. Salvador Perez up to the plate now in that five spot. Ground ball to short. It's a double play. I think Salvador Perez is the one guy I think I'm going to move down a little bit. Not that he doesn't, you know, have the pop to hit at the top of the lineup. It's just that he's a guy that I can kind of move around a little bit. Especially with his speed, as that brings up Brandon Lau, who hits one too short. It's knocked down by Ahmad Rosario, and it will get a run across the plate with two outs. So it's a 3-2 to two ball game, as that brings up Oscar Colas, who is uh, in the game here, giving Dylan Carlson the day off, but he's in left field, and that one will be a fly ball to left for the third out of the inning. So we do decide to leave Bay Miller in, and he goes over 100 pitches with that one as he clunks Jose Ramirez on the knee, and now it's bases loaded. We thought about going to the bullpen, but I just need Bay Miller to pitch in tough situations and learn how to pitch out of them. But that proves to be a mistake, as that one is down the left field line. It scores one, it scores two. It's a 5-2 to two ball game in the end of the day here for Babe Miller. He did not have a great outing. I need to be able to solve Babe Miller because if it turns out that he's going to be just a relief pitcher, it's kind of a bummer because we already have a decent relief pitcher right now and a lot of our starters that we keep moving to the bullpen when they don't work out. I can't have a ton of long relievers in the bullpen. It just doesn't make sense. I need guys that can come in one, two innings and really shut it down. But maybe Bay Miller can be one of those guys. I might have to tr transition him over. But one guy that's been a shining star in this series is Jacob McDonald. Quietly was our one of our draft picks in uh, season one. And he was up at the major leagues in his first major league season. He didn't start there, but he did end up getting moved up as an 18-year-old, and he's been nails ever since. So on to the bottom of the fifth inning as McDonald gets us out of that one, bringing up Joey Manassas, who turns on one. Deep to left field. The Arrows have the lead. A 6-5 to five ball game off of the three-run home run. And Manessas hits his 15th of the year. If he keeps on this track, he's headed to the home run derby. But this is why you trade for guys like this. We traded for Manessas uh, prior, actually just last year, actually, at the trade deadline. And he has been very, very good. I mean, to say the least. I mean, he has been our DH. He can't play in the field because he sucks at a, as fielding. But that brings up Paulo Reyes up to the plate next, who hits one deep to center field. Is that caught? No, it's gone. That one was close to being robbed. And back-to-back -back home runs here for the Arrows. And that's why you have the bats that you have. In a instant, the game can flip just like that. Paulo Reyes has been remarkable to watch because I love watching guys who you had as prospects they end up coming up they end up having a specialty and Paulo Reyes just hits the ball hard every single time speaking of hitting the ball hard that brings up Brandon Lau to the play who faces Tanner Bibby out of the bullpen and Brandon Lau every time we hit with him it seems like he's either hitting a home run or a double that brings up Oscar Colas to the plate now with two outs man on second base he gets one over the middle of the plate and hits one hard to left center that one will get down in the gap it will score one oscar colas will have an rbi double here it's eight to five we have put it on the uh cleveland guardians after being down five to two and it looks like we're not done scoring as that brings up cam collier to the plate now he gets a hanger and hits one well to right center field cam collier it's a double. Now, Cam Collier has been very, very good hitting at the bottom of the lineup ever since we acquired him. He needed a little time to warm up, but it didn't take him long. Pat Washington comes to the plate now. Fly ball to right field. And it's wow. I, I can't believe this offense sometimes. We just explode at any instant. Bottom six now. Paulo Reyes one for two at the plate. Runners on first and second. 
Hitting one well to right center field here in the bottom of the sixth inning. That one will score two more than likely, and it does. Paulo Reyes coming through again. And like I said, he just always hits the ball hard. It's just what he does. And it's 11-5 to five here in this one. And Paulo, a lot of the guys in the comments section see him as one of the favorites here in this series as they go to the bullpen, bring in Ayel De Los Santos, and he will face Salvador Perez. 2-1 pitch outside, and Perez goes with it. That's a screamer down the right field line. It gets all the way to the wall. Perez gets it in the second with an easy double, but a 12-5 whooping here of the Guardians. And we're still not done. Brandon Lau, three for three today. He gets one over the middle. This one's driven deep to dead center. It's gone. 14 to five. The Arrows brought their sticks with them back home. And it's a huge, huge victory here for the Arrows. I did not expect all of these big flies, to be honest with you. Lau is absolutely incredible at the plate. And we end up winning this one 16 to 5. 18 hits in this one all around. I've never seen this type of offensive display, at least in this series yet. It was bound to happen, especially with the explosion of bats that we have and the collection of bats that we have. But look at this. Everybody gets a hit in this game. Everybody at least scores once. And only two guys, Pat Washington, literally our fastest guy, and Salvador Perez, literally our slowest guy, score once. It's incredible. Look at the averages on the year. We are hitting the ball great. You gotta love it. You just absolutely gotta love it. This was an excellent game here for the Arrows. We end up beating the uh, Cleveland Guardians three out of four at home. We end up beating the Minnesota Twins on the road three of four. And now we get to the final week of the season where we play Houston at home three games and they actually sweep us at home. And Sean Manai gets his first loss on the season, so he is 7-1. And, and we get to the end of the month of May, and we are still hovering around 33 and 26, that kind of range where we have five more wins than we do losses. It's just a tough going here to start the season. We actually end up losing two of three on the road versus a bad Washington team. I don't like that. We face uh, Colorado. We win two of three right there. But then we get some pretty big news. One of our top prospects who was probably the closest uh, position player to being moved up, he gets hurt, JL Monte. He is 21 years old. He's out with a broken forearm one to two months. I'm not saying he was gonna be moved up right now, but he was close. At 75 overall, I think he could have helped right away, but we'll let him sit on the IL and then evaluate him when he comes back. We are 37 and 30 here to start the month of June. We are hitting 268 as a team, and our averages are very, very high. Like, we have some players hitting extremely well to start the season. The first is Joey Manessis and Ray Gonzalez. I mean, those two are hitting great. If Ray Gonzalez can hit like this every season, I mean, watch out. He's going to be a superstar, an all-star every year. He is great. Alex Verdugo hitting 285. He has never regressed in this series. I mean, he has just been great. Cam Collier hitting 260. That's about what I expect from him, but he's hitting the ball pretty hard every time at the plate. Dylan Carlson has got that average up to 257. Remember, he was a slow starter. Pat Washington also hitting 255. That's kind of what I expect from him. Brandon Lau has 11 home runs. Paulo Reyes is hitting 247. I would expect that average to be a little higher. He's definitely on a cold streak, but I don't expect him to be down too long. He's too good of a hitter. On the mound, though, Tafon Edwards has been by far our best starter. He has been great. Actually, no, scratch that. Sean Maniah has been great, but Tafon Edwards is just as good. He won Rookie of the Year last year, and it's showing that he is not, that is not a fluke. Like, he's going to be back in this good for a while. Todd Workman is struggling. A 5.27 ERA, 1.64 whip for him. That's definitely not good. We're going to have to keep an eye on him and Bay Miller. Bay Miller at least has a low whip. Todd Workman is just getting worked on the mound. No pun intended. Carl Edwards is pretty horrible this year. Now, we signed him to a two-year, $5 million contract with a club option, but he's got a 5.27 ERA and a 1.83 whip. 
I think we're definitely going to need to address that pretty soon because I don't want him to lose games. And if he does lose them, I think he's going to have to go either DFA him or move him down. I think that's going to be the result. So next episode here, we get through the month of June and we will probably get to the draft and we will draft our prospects of the future. And to be honest, that could be a pretty big draft because last year we had a tremendous draft. We drafted like three of the top five prospects in our first three picks. So this year we're probably looking for guys that maybe will be the future because we could use some of the draft picks we've had the last couple of years as trade chips to bring in another pitcher because you can see we are having issues with our rotation especially with Bay miller todd workman so we need another arm or maybe even two so hit subscribe hit that like button hope you guys enjoyed this episode stay tuned let's get it let's go I like getting money, I got time to get it. Target on me, so my car's a tenny. Dancing with the devil, I don't bargain with it. Bobbing in a dash, and the stick is with it. And I hit the four or five on the wet side. But I'm from the east side, this how we slide. This how we ride, yeah, yeah, this how we ride.